effectively, as we're saying here, we're talking about high performance nutrition and training for higher training loads and answering some of the questions around why some of the um, maybe what you're seeing in the plans around higher carbohydrates and why that's occurring. Uh, we'll talk about leading into races because races are um, either have started or are fast approaching. Obviously, with the ocean side, uh, we have a number of athletes competing in that event. And then we'll just open it up in terms of a open Q and A. If you've got any session, if you've got any questions, but certainly any time throughout this, please just just interrupt me and just go for it. But let's treat it as like a classroom type session. Um, so I think first thing. I sent an email out and hopefully quite a few of you got it or at least read it with regards to uh, a change in the way that we were thinking about um, some of the prescription. And what, what we realized is what we were seeing in January, um, certainly in January was a marked increase in not just the training uh, volume, but we're also seeing a change in the volume intensity and uh, the training intensity. And as a result, total training load was going up. And based on the way in which we prescribe the nutrition, which is around grams per kilo body weight, which when you look at a lot of the research now is a much better way of prescribing uh, your calorie intake, is that we were probably missing a factor on that, which accounted for this increased training volume. So as a result, what we've done is apply a number to that, which based on, you know, you know the number of hours you're doing depending on the number of hours will apply a factor to the total amount of carbohydrates that you're consuming so some of you will have seen in that early stage because we actually just did a blanket reset on everyone that a lot of people were like whoa i'm suddenly eating a lot more carbohydrates and a lot of my days are either amber or green and what you're probably starting to see now is that tailing back down to uh, being more in line with probably what you're expecting. So just to make it very clear, if, if you're under 10 hours of training, there won't be any factor applied to it. Um, so what you'll be getting is the, just the purely the grams per kilo of body weight. When we then go above that and we've broken it into several sort of segments, uh, those with 18 plus hours who is, is not a vast majority of you, but there is quite a few of you, you will see a significant factor to account for that carbohydrate. And to, it's really just about total energy. And the easiest macronutrient for us to um, manipulate is going to be carbohydrates uh, to allow you to get your total caloric intake in. Uh, and you will also see that with a lot of the lighter athletes, especially the females, that there is a factor applied to your fat intake as well. Again, just to get that total calorie intake up. Um, does anyone have any, just be, like, I know that's probably a lot just to take in over the top, but does anyone have any questions about that? Or has anyone noticed a difference in their program and sort of was wondering why you were seeing a lot more either amber or green meals? Someone feel feel free to jump in. Is that, it's usually it's usually when right? one person says one thing and then everyone goes, okay, I can speak. So are you speaking like kind of across the given week or a given day or a session? Or yes? Yeah. So we look at we look at the total number of hours in the week. Um, and then we'll compare that to the previous week as well. So what we're taking into account when we're looking at the total calories for the week being prescribed. It is going to be accounted for based on what the previous week's training volume was. So if your training volume went up 25%, we're not going to increase your caloric intake by 25%, but you certainly will see a bump in that calories for the week on. Now, again, if that training volume drops and say you dropped a training volume and, and the percentages can be quite high depending on how low your training volume is. You know, if you're going from a 10 to an eight hour training, that's a 20% drop. Uh, whereas if you're dropping from say 17 hours down to you know 14 hours, it may not be as big percentage. So then we've got to, and it's important, I think, for all the athletes to understand that there is a lot of background calculations going into trying to maintain, you know, what your overriding goal is. Um, you know, if your goal is weight loss, then we're taking into account hopefully a caloric deficit week on week based on your training volume, which your training volume could be going up, but we're trying to apply a relative calorie deficit. So 
the actual relative deficit could result in an increase in calories for the week, week on week, even though relatively speaking, it is a deficit based on the total training volume. And I think that point is often missed on a lot of athletes. They don't quite understand how the week before is influencing the week that they're currently in. And it, it's, if you look at that, um, what we call a motivation cell at the top of each day, you can swipe right on that and left and you'll see um, some numbers which compare previous week's training volume to current week's training volume and there'll be a percentage. And then same for the calories um, in terms of the week's calories prescription versus last week's calories prescription. And you'll see a percentage difference there. And it's good for you guys to, uh, I refer to guys, I'm saying guys and girls, um, to look at that and, and start to educate yourselves on, okay, I can see how my training volume is increasing and how they're potentially increasing the calories in relation to that, or that I am in a slight deficit in relation to what my goal is. Um, is that, is the, does that help? One, quick, one more quick question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is no, the, don't, be, don't be quick. Don't be quick. <laughs> okay. Is that kind of coefficient like still, it's still distributed though throughout the week based Correct. on a given session or a given set of sessions in a given day? Correct. So then, then you go into the logic behind each day, which is why we need to ensure that the Z score is entered into it. So we know what the intensity is. And then we also need to know what the timing of those sessions are because the timing of that session, if it's a high intensity and a, a long duration session, that's going to have implications on the meal that we give you before the session and then the post-fueling session. So whilst it may sometimes seem like a pain in the ass to be going, oh, why do I need to put the Z score in or why do I need to put the time of day in? You start to see the picture of like, oh, so I, I get it. Like if it's in the morning and it's really hard or it, it, let's go the other way and go, it's a Z2 session and your primary goal is probably just getting some caloric burn you know, working on metabolic adaptation, we're probably going to look to maybe give you some type of carbohydrates before it, maybe not a green meal, but then even afterwards, we might say, you know what, we don't need you consuming a heap of carbs post-session. We actually just want you focusing on protein and a little bit of fat intake and a relatively small amount of carbs to then just allow you to go into that adaptation phase. And that, that's all, you know, as we're building this out, we're working on better and better um, logic behind how we would apply that based on what you're trying to achieve. And so I think, yeah, does that answer your question with that, Jason? Because I know it's, it is that what you guys see is just a color block, but the, the decision making behind where that color block goes is actually really complicated. Um, and, and so like the more you guys can help with the getting the times accurate, and the Z scores, it really does make a difference to what your plan will look like. Um, and so I'd like to emphasize that. Now, something we've talked about, and I'd love to get all like the athletes sort of thoughts on this is what we do at the start, we say, you know, what, what is your current weight? What's your goal weight? And a lot of you will have like a goal weight of below. We get that. A lot of you want to lose weight. Um, some of you want to gain weight and that's fantastic. And some of you just want to main weight, maintain weight, but a lot of you actually want to drop weight. I think what, what's something we've talked about is I think we need to, and again, this comes down to the start of January. We saw January, all this volume and everything go through the roof and intensity, but everyone was still saying, oh, they want to lose weight. Now, as a coach, that's very difficult. Or as a nutritionist, I believe it's very difficult to achieve that. If you're trying to perform and smash your sessions out of the park and really work on your performance aspect, yet at the same time trying to lose weight, I think we're butting heads with each other. And this is where I think what I was seeing and talking to Elizabeth and Jonathan, we, we were seeing there was disparity in what we were giving you in terms of calories based on your goal to lose weight versus actually the real goal was performance at that standpoint on what the coach was giving you. And actually we should have been fueling you like a lot more, which is why we made that decision to actually give you a lot more calories to allow you to do that. So one of the things I would like, and we'll probably build it in as an actual feature is I think, I personally think all the athletes on the program, you should be thinking in either one or two week blocks and saying to yourselves, 
what am I trying to achieve? Am I trying to achieve performance in the next two weeks or am I trying to achieve weight loss? And that's a discussion with your coach, but also a discussion with yourself and saying, okay, I actually want to perform at the best. I'm not even worried about my weight. So if that is the case, put your weight in what your target weight is, reset it in the settings to what your current weight is because it will have a huge impact on what we actually provide you in terms of nutrition. You, you will see if you change that weight to be your current weight, your plan will look remarkably different from what it would look like if your goal weight is five kilos below. Um, and so I don't know what all of you think about that concept in terms of maybe working in smaller sprints or smaller blocks. Um, to achieve your goals? Do you guys like the idea of that and being, would you want a prompt on a fortnightly basis or a weekly basis to ask you what your current goal is? Yeah, Scott, I, I think the tricky part always is the, I think the athlete's propensity is always to want to be lighter. <laughs> and so like it's like, that's the tricky part is like, what is the optimized race weight? And I know that's highly subjective and very tricky to get to, but I think the athlete will always have something in their mind that is lower than where they're at. And so the conflict is ongoing. And it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, I mean, I guess in a perfect world, it would be easy to reconcile that, but I think it's just hard, you know, especially when you're at this stage, when you're entering into the season, you're not in the season yet. So you want to get lighter, but you got to get ready for the season. So you want to perform. <laughs> yeah. And Scotty, I, look, I, I completely hear what you're saying. And we've talked about this a lot. It's like, you know, how can we get the athletes thinking about what is it you want to achieve at this point in time? And yes, look, everyone wants to be lighter. I think we can all just say, okay, well, that's pretty much 90, 90 odd percent of athletes want to be lighter. And probably a vast majority of athletes got into the sport of triathlon to actually lose weight, weirdly enough. Um, whether that's the best way of losing weight, I'm not convinced, but that's a whole different story. Um, yeah, but I think getting the athletes and you, all you athletes to think about, you know, like if your coach is giving you 15 hours of pretty punchy training, don't like also accept that actually fueling those sessions appropriately without starving yourselves will probably inadvertently result in you potentially losing weight anyway um, because you'll perform better. You'll sleep better. You'll, you'll crush the session. You'll refuel. Like you just will be better as an athlete if the volume or the total load, if we just want to talk about intensity and, and volume together, is really high. Um, and I, I'm just fascinated to know how, how athletes think about that and whether you do actually think about what are you trying to achieve in this week or this fortnight or this month? Does everyone think about that or do you just overall think, I just want to lose weight? I, I'll speak. Can you guys yeah. hear me okay? Who's speaking? Oh, I'm Celie Gutierrez. Hi, Celie. Um, hello. Um, I did not get into the sport to lose weight. I got into the sport because I'm ADHD with my exercise. <laughs> um, but as far as the weight conversation goes, I, I've been in a sport for a while and I do look at it more as a big picture long-term. Where I am right now is not where I want to be or is not where I will be at the end of October, which is my goal race for the year. And I know as the intensity and in workouts increases, the weight just naturally comes off. And so really, honestly, if I'm at my quote unquote race weight in April, it's not going to be good in October. I'm either going to end up hurt or burnt out or, or just, yeah, there, it's not going to be a positive. So I'm okay with being a little, and I mean, we're talking like, we're not talking a lot of weight difference yeah. here. I'm okay being a, you know, a couple pounds chunkier right now, knowing that that's going to more than likely burn off um, in, by, by October. So I like the idea of having that check in every couple weeks of like, what is the goal? I think that's good to, to keep in mind. 
and I really like what you're talking about, Acelia. And it's actually, I was talking to a pro athlete this morning about this who unfortunately has an injury. And I'm like, no one remembers the start, the athletes at the start of the season. Like everyone remembers you at the end of the season when the big races are on. Like, let, let's be real here. And um, I know uh, Matt uh, Dixon actually posted something yesterday. I think it was in the Instagram on their Purple Patch one that was about like, B races are not a waste of time like B races. And I commented on it because I was like, absolutely. Like you don't have to be at your absolute best going into a B race, but that B race can provide you with a hell of a lot of information to prepare you for the next race. And what I think everyone just thinks, Oh, well, I'll just race. Like I'm just going to race, but treat every, every session, every race as a potential to learn about yourself and, and learn about what you're trying to achieve. And to your point, Silly, like, yeah, you don't have to be at your absolute, you know, race weight come that first race of the season because it's probably the last thing that's going to influence the result of that race, to be honest. Like you covering, even if it's, you know, you talked about a couple of pounds, I, I would argue even if someone's carrying, you know, five to 10, maybe five kilos or so, it's probably not going to have that big your impact because it's more going to come down to around like how you actually practically manage your nutrition on the course and how you manage your hydration strategy on the course around the weather. And, and was that actually, could you carry the, the amount of nutrition? Could you actually get it into you? And, and I think everyone, I think again, that focus on weight, and I, I'm very cognizant of this as, as a product because I know we, we talk about macronutrients. We do ask you about your weight goal, the, the caloric, um, what we're telling you to consume often is based around weight loss because that is an overriding goal of a lot of the athletes. But I think if, if as a group, we can all start to go, is it my key metric at this point in time? No, it's not. Actually, I want to really, I want to go really fast in this next race and I'm not even worried about how heavy I am. I just want to work on my hydration strategy, my carb fueling, my recovery strategy, all that. Then I think we're in a much better place as a team um so yeah that i think what you're saying certainly you know it resonates with me silly and i, I hopefully it resonates with um you know not just the female athletes i think with the male athletes as well but it doesn't have to always be you know lose you see plenty of big athletes out there do very well okay they they may not be the pro athletes but they still do very well in their um their age group viv you had a um i think you were raising your hand viv yeah, I did. Um, hi, Scott. Hi, everyone. Um, just a comment, I guess, for my own, uh, you know, from my own personal experience, and we've obviously worked together for a little bit. Um, I definitely could notice the um, the increase in carbohydrates, as you were saying before, um, compared to what I sort of used to be before. Maybe I was in, in like a more aggressive approach at the time as well. Um, but, um, I definitely, although I could realize that that has increased the feel that I have, um, before a training session or during a session is the same. So I don't think that that's changed how I'm feeling. Um, and I'm not going to lie, like most female athletes, I want to be lighter because that always personally has helped my run. Um, but just as a comment, and I guess my own personal appearance for from you know for people that are just starting the plan or starting to work with you is that for me it's more the feel like I get um how recover I, I feel after sessions or after eating or whatever it is um but yeah it's just that feeling that I have in my whole body if that makes sense um when I'm actually um during you know during training or during the race how my feeling is more than just the number on the scales if that makes sense and I do look at it but um yeah I think going with that feel of of um I'm feeling not necessarily lighter because you you will if you are following the plan um but yeah it's just more more that feel of um being recovered and being able to perform during training and during races if that makes sense yeah no, 100 percent it does and I, I guess with this and look you know, there are, I know there's everyone on different sort of tiers and, and that, you know, has an impact on obviously communication and things. But 
I would encourage you, you know, like if, if you are feeling really shit on energy, like let us know. Like if you're really struggling with what's being prescribed, like let us know. But likewise, if you're like, you know, I'm feeling amazing, let us know as well. Like, you know, that's, that's good to reinforce the message and, and for us to adapt and adjust and learn as we go with both males and females and how you're actually achieving what is, whatever your goal is at that point in time. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, you know, there is, there's so many factors to this sport that have to be accounted for from, you know, your, your overarching goals to how you're feeling, to how you're recovering, to how you're performing. So, um, yeah, just keep, keep feedback coming. And some of you are really good and uh, some of you are not so good. And, and even, even the ones that are on one-to-one sometimes uh, aren't even that good with me. And uh, it's sort of, I'm always like, oh, is, is enough happening? But, uh, you know, I guess end of the day, if you're all doing well and you're all feeling good, then that's, that's the main thing for our perspective. Um, so I guess the, the next one is like fueling long sessions. Uh, did it, well, before we go on, did anyone have any more questions around that and uh, any other feedback or anything like that? It's all good? Okay. So fueling long sessions. And Jay, are you, with this point, are you referring to uh, questions around how to fuel the long sessions or what we're currently recommending in the fueling of the long sessions? Yeah, it's just what we're recommending and just sharing context around that, you know, especially I think for some of the newer <clears throat> athletes that may have joined recently. Yeah. So what you'll, what you'll see is generally on a, if most of you do longer sessions over the weekend. So a lot of you will see on a Friday, the day may be higher carb. Um, so it could be an it could be an amber day or it could be a green day that you may only be doing like a 40 minute swim and you may be saying why the hell is it a green day when I'm not doing anything and the reason for that is because we're looking forward to the next day where most likely if it is a green day on that Friday we're giving you enough fuel to actually cope with that three hour plus session the next day and so we're not necessarily you know, whether you want to think of it as a carb load or not, I, I wouldn't technically call it a carb load because we're not probably going high enough. Um, a true carb load when we're talking about the race carbohydrate is, is going to be a higher amount, sort of six to seven grams for carbs. For this day, for that green day, it's sitting at around five grams. And you can, you know, you can vary it up a little bit more depending on what that session is the next day. And so I think it's important for you to recognize despite not having a long training day that day the reason it may be green or higher amounts of carbs on that day is looking forward to the next 24 hours brett you had a question yeah with regards to timing of let's say a green snack before a four to five hour ride i mean in terms of you know even like your blood glucose what is the ideal time to sort of have that pre-session you know higher carb snack um you know yeah. and and you know it's called a snack in the app just i i mean personally i think everything should just be meal one meal two but i think for clarity a lot of people like breakfast lunch dinner but that i mean that snack one especially if it's the first thing of the day and then you're going after that's a that's a full meal i mean that that snack if it's green it's 100 grams of carbs so i would personally i'd be treating it more and more like a a race type meal and you're practicing that so you're saying to yourself okay what would i do on race day now you're probably going to aim to consume that probably at least two hours before race day um is that your experience brett yeah uh, yeah that's what i do on race day um but on a saturday um you, you don't know. want to get up at four in the morning <laughs> <laughs> exactly and so that's why you know like is it beneficial to try to do that or you yeah. know okay so i think well there's two parts to this isn't there it's like context if that training session is full on race mode and you're practicing a brick, you know, which is, and, and as I've talked about many times, like these 90s, like 90 minutes on the bike with a 90 minute runoff and you're practicing your race fueling in that session, then absolutely I would practice your race meal before that. And I would do the timing. I would try and get up two hours before, get it in. Even if you've got to go back to bed, do that. Um, but I would, I would, Try and practice that meal. Uh, and you're not going to do it all the time, but you might just pick some specific weekends where you go, you know what, let's treat this um, as that. And maybe instead of going for the swim, go for a walk after that meal 
And so, you know, just get it, get it moving, everything like that, and then go into your race, into that brick going, okay, now I start the brick, now I start the race fueling strategy, which is, you know, 15 to 20 minutes into the start of that bike, then you go, then you're on your carb fueling, you're trying to get the amounts in, you know, you're feeding either as a male every 15 to 20 minutes, as a female every 20 to 30 minutes with a goal of getting, you know, that carbohydrate amount in, um, you know, trying to get at least 60 grams an hour in as we go up in body weight and ability, you know, you're pushing that 90 grams an hour to up to 120 grams an hour and you're practicing that systematically over time. And then you come to your run off your bike and again, treat it like a T2, you know, go through the T2, have all your clothes ready, wrapped up in the bundle, time yourself, practice it. You've got all your nutrition there ready to go. Like I think of, all I can think of is Pat Romano, who's an engineer. And if you've ever, like he has his hat and everything's bundled up in it. He's got his stuff. He, he goes through his transition in like under two minutes or something and he's out the door. And then he, and then again, 15 to 20 minutes into that run off the bike. Now you start your nutrition so that you've practiced that a number of times so that when you come to the race, it's like, I got this. I know exactly what I'm doing. You know, you, you just go through T1, you go through T2 and you, it's just, methodical and then all you have to focus on is the actual race as opposed to eating and worrying about oh can i get this in or where where's this and where's that so i i would certainly do that now brett the the caveat to that is if you've got gut issues there is some advantage to eating just before training um because what that does is distend the gut it makes you feel very full and what that can do is train the brain so what you start, there's a big part of a brain uh, element to the gut and GI distress. So you filling yourself up and, you know, let's say you have a green, a green breakfast before a green meal before your training, that could be rice bubbles. Um, it could be your overnight oats. Um, it could be toast. It could be a combination of all that. Whatever your pre-race meal is, consuming that maybe, you know, 30 minutes before you actually go out and distending the gut and being under some discomfort can actually prove beneficial as well. So I wouldn't discount doing that to help train the gut in a different manner. Have you done that before, Brett? Yeah, I mean, most of my Saturday breakfasts are between 30 to 45 minutes before just because, you know, I've got a kid and mornings are a complete disaster. So, um, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of my experience with it. So the irony with that is 30 to 45 minutes is probably going to result in the peak, oh, sorry, in the, the bottom of your blood glucose as you get on the bike. So around 40 minutes, generally 30 to 40 minutes is when you'll bottom out with blood glucose if you haven't had another feed within that 45 minutes as an uh, interesting point. <laughs> so you're probably better off either trying to eat 60 to 90 minutes before or maybe 15 minutes before you get on got it um and i don't know what your experience with that do you tend to feel pretty shitty when you first get on the bike yes definitely yeah so that that's probably what's happening is you're actually you and then 15 minutes in you have something and you start to feel good and then actually you'll get a rapid rise in your blood glucose again because it's gone through that insulin response um, and if any of you have worn um, super sapiens or that it, it's generally what we see is um, people who eat 30 to 40 minutes before going out actually have their lowest blood sugars as they get on the bike. Um, whereas they probably think that they would be in a good position by that. So um, yeah, you're probably better off as I say. And that, that's the same for like when you're going in for the swim, what we encourage is, you know, five to 10 minutes before you hit the swim, maybe have your gel then because if the swim's going to take you what, 30 minutes, would you say majority of you? Yep. Hopefully, hopefully it's 30 minutes. You're probably getting out of the water as you're feeling, you're probably just starting to come down into that trough. You go through potentially, depending on how you're feeling, you could have a quick gel at T1. And again, this is individual. You could have a gel at T1, get your levels back up and then settle in for 15 minutes on the bike because you're going from that horizontal to slightly more upright position just to settle into the bike and get used to it. So there, there's some considerations as well you might want to think of. And again, it's no one, what I'm always laugh at is no one ever practices. I, I don't think I've ever seen in a training program, although I think Sarah P used to swim into bike transition. 
and it, I, I've never really understood why no one practices that from the swim to the bike, but it's probably more just a practicality thing and no one wants to be wet on the bike. Is that, is that what it comes down to? Yeah, I've never done that before. <laughs> it, it's crazy because it's such a big part of the race. Hey, eh? how many people feel shit when they get on their bike out of the run, out of the swim, but no one ever practices it. It's like, why doesn't anyone practice this? So I don't know if any of you are coaches and can answer that. I'd love to know. So well, yeah. especially if you're I, a bad swimmer, <laughs> especially if you're a bad swimmer and and you want to get on your bike and try and perform after having a bad swim. I think it's, it certainly seems logical to me. Who, who was going to say something? Jason had a Jason. Is that Jason? Yeah, and, and maybe I heard um, some of the answer in, in your last go around, but you know, and, and maybe I'm a bad student, but you know, when I when I see some of the the carb um, uh, practicing on on sessions, you know, they're like an hour, maybe an hour and a half. I gotta say, I, I skip those usually because I'm like, what's what value am I gonna get out of understanding my GI distress or anything? But but maybe there's some practice element in in, in doing that and just getting familiar with it. But is, is there really any? I guess my original question is: there really any value in that? Because I gotta say, I'm kind of a bad student. When I see an hour session or an hour and a half, and you're telling me to fuel, I'm usually not doing it. You know. Yeah, look, Jason, I think it comes down to the individual. So it's a really good point is I think what we're doing is we're giving recommendations and that that carb testing within that bike session wouldn't be for anything under, I think it's 80 minutes or, or 90 minutes. We wouldn't recommend anything under that. Um, but in your case, like you don't have any GI issues or anything like that. So it's not being recommended. Like you can look at it and go, you know what? I'm the individual here. I, I get this. Like they are saying there is value in it to do that testing. But actually in my case, I don't need to do it today. But you know what? They are saying I could get value out of this. So maybe look at that and go, you know what? This weekend, I've got a 90 minute bike. The race isn't too far away. I'm gonna practice my carb consumption. Gels are expensive, I get that. Like all that stuff's expensive. You might, because you've got a very, you know, your, your threshold for GI training is very low or very high because you you don't have any issues and your actual your carb consumption rate is really good we know comfortably that you can get in quite a lot of grams per hour you you but you also got to that level like you you improve systematically over time so some of those recommendations as you continue along the trajectory of the program you go you know what i don't need to do that today but for another athlete who maybe joined that program that 80 minute ride or 90 minute ride at z3 and they've never practiced carbohydrate consumption that it's probably going to be invaluable to them so probably uh you know as we get smarter with this there might be the option to like really start to tailor it down and say you know what with someone like jason we know that he's and what we're working on is that whatever you're recording in the carb consumption testing is actually going to be pulling through to the session so we're going to be saying, hey, look, you're hitting 75 grams an hour. Actually, Jace, we want you to get to 90 grams an hour now. That's your goal. And so you start to see, oh, okay, so it's a 90-minute session, but my carb consumption rate at the moment is peak 75 grams. You as an individual should be at 120 grams really on the bike. And that's what we'd be aiming for. And so you, got, you start to go, oh, I thought I was really good, but maybe I'm not as good as I need to be. Um, and I, that personalization with that is coming. Um, and I think it will be a really cool feature. Same for the hydration, where we can, you know, what you guys are recording in the sweat rate data is actually going to pull through to uh, show you what you're currently consuming in terms of liters per hour and how that looks like compared to your sweat rate. And that, that's the point when we come to like all these long sessions, like, I cannot stress how, my, how important it is for all of you to be logging, you know, the sweat data and the carb data on this. Like, I know it might seem like a ball ache, but when you get, when you get that understanding of like, oh, I get it, I've got to drink 800 mils or whatever, what's 700, uh, what's that, 32 ounces, something like that. I've got to drink 32 ounces at this temperature on the bike, otherwise my sweat loss, I'm losing three and a half percent body weight. Like, 
once you get that through enough data points, that's the game changer in the program because you, you start to just, then you build on that. And every time, every session you're doing, you know, a race simulated session, you're, you're managing to get that mount in. And that's a form of gut training. It's a form of like so, uh, solidifying your hydration strategy and then building in your carb intake on top of that. And that, that's a lot of work to do, but it, it's only going to happen over a series of weekends. And, and, you know, it could take 10 weeks before you get those data points, because a lot of you are only doing one long session per week. Um, you know, again, if you look at the research and you look at the studies, they will, they will do 10 consecutive days of carb training. So you imagine doing 10 long sessions in a row, trying to consume 90 grams or more of carbohydrates for every day of those sessions. Like that's what creates adaptation. But in the real world, we don't have that. You know, I don't know how many of you are ever going to do 10 consecutive days of race pace and, uh, and carb fueling. So, you know, we just, we, we do the best we can with what, what's put in front of us. And so thinking about that, that that's where I think you can, you can make some real gains in your, your race preparation. Um, anyone got any other questions about long fuel, fueling long sessions? Okay. Um, the only thing I would add to that is, and, and back to um, uh, Brett's question was like, whatever, wherever you choose to put that timing, what I would say is eat the same thing. Like do not try and play around with too many food options. Like find something you love on race day morning and eat it. It doesn't have to like, you know, for me, I, I think the ideal is something like your oats because it provides a sustained release of carbohydrates. Put your fats in it, whatever nut butter or nuts and seeds in it that you want um, to get your, your total fat intake up. Your protein with a scoop of protein or a scoop and a half, depending on your size in those oats, mix it up. Have your fruit with that, whether that's a half a banana or a whole banana, you know, banana and a half, depending on, again, on your body size and how much carbohydrates you're needing. Um, and then one or two bits of toast and, and work that into your system. But just build out like every pro athlete I've ever worked with, they just have their race day meal. That is it. They do not deviate from that. And same for the night before. Don't, don't go and cook a cabanara because you think a cabanara would be nice the night before for a pasta feed. Like that pasta feed is for a purpose. It is going to be very, very plain. You're minimizing risk. You're also minimizing uh, the, the risk that you won't be able to have that meal when you go traveling. So pick something like a plain pasta with a tomato base with chicken. Like it, doesn't have to be Jamie Oliver sort of style like but if you go to any Italian restaurant or you're cooking in your own kitchen when you're away for a trip for a race you know you can get that in um, and that's just the practical side of it like I think everyone gets too hung up on trying to make all these amazing meals and the reality is you just need for that type of meal you just need to be thinking what am I trying to achieve and it's purely performance and getting the amount of foods in Brett, did you have another question or you still got your hand raised? Yeah, uh, I don't want to dominate the question asking. So No, 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 I love it. I love um, it. It's so good. It's so good. So I know that you prescribe mostly solid foods, right? Due to its, its um, you know, GI um, impact. But I don't know if anyone else feels this way, but if I'm, you know, on the bike doing, I don't know, 90% of FTP efforts, I find it actually hard to like, actually chew or swallow cliff blocks like and it's like sometimes you know i i almost choke on them and like uh, just yeah i'm curious like what you're thinking there is because like obviously liquid carbs are much easier to consume and get down especially when you're doing a harder effort and i just find it hard to chew stuff if i'm you know smashing the bike or the run just i'm curious on your thoughts there yeah i think um in a race would you be doing 90 percent ftp no, but I mean, 70.3 effort for my coach is 80, 80% 80 of FTP, 85, which is, you know, I mean, still hard to choose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I get it. Um, I think there is always going to be that individual variation as well. <clears throat> and I think this part comes into course management. So I think when, you know, if you look at it again, those 15 minutes, if I say you're eating every 15 minutes, 
It doesn't mean, and I, I, I've referred to this before, like you don't have to get everything in in that second on the 15 minutes. You've actually got 15 minutes to get those three cliff blocks in. So that, that could be something that's a game changer for you because you go, you know what, fuck, I'm working so hard at this minute or this few minutes because you're going up an incline or something, but then you might come down a slight, you know, it might be a descent at that point in time and you go, okay, now I can eat, I can get it in now. And so I think thinking about that is important. If the cliff blocks don't work for you, and I have athletes that they're just like, I just want gels. I am going to do pure gels or I'm going to have a mixture of some carbohydrate in liquid form mixed into their electrolyte in low concentration. Um, and then what they have, they put their literally, they literally are putting their gels in their drink bottles now. Um, and I don't know if you've done that, but it works. Uh, so they're using say the endurance tap. They'll just put that in their drink bottle. They practice a squirt and they know that that's roughly 30 grams in their mouth. That's something to think about. And again, this is like the practical stuff that I'd love all you guys as athletes to share and go, holy shit, I, I put in like the precision gels into my bottle and I put a little bit of water in with it. Um, and it, it was actually, I could drink it. I could actually drink the gels out of my bottle and that was a game changer. I didn't have to rip the lid off them. I didn't have to chew on blocks, things like that. Um, I think all that sort of stuff to share is really cool. And again, we're working on, you know, how can you guys share ideas and things like that within the app? But yeah, even from a standpoint, just feel free to send it through to us and we can then share with everyone. Um, <clears throat> I think the other thing to remember is, yes, we recommend carbohydrates in um, uh, like solid form. There are athletes that I do work with that, you know, they will drink some of their carbs, um, but it's, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I don't have anything against you drinking your carbs as long as you can drink them, you feel great on the bike, but you also practice your run off the bike and you don't get GI distress because so many athletes will just go, yeah, I drink all my carbs on the bike. It's awesome. They forget about the run off the bike. They do the run off the bike and they feel terrible. So I think if you are going to practice using, um, say like I know a lot of people are using the precision fuel at the moment, their, their carb mix. Um, Morton obviously is on the race course. Um, so I think if you, if you want to practice using that, uh, Elliot used Tailwind, I think, didn't you, Elliot, for the Ultraman? Did you use Tailwind? Elliot? Uh, for the run. So you did use Tailwind for the run and he felt, I mean, for me, Ultraman's a little bit slower, I guess. I used, but, yeah. Um, sorry. Right. Hey, so uh, actually, oh, are you, are you hearing me? Yeah. So, you know, we've been practicing for a while doing on the bike, jails blocks and picky bars. And ultimately I dropped the picky bars, actually very similar to what we were talking about. I just couldn't eat, chew enough of those. Too hard. So I don't have a problem with, in some ways for me, the gels are easier. I mean, I'm sorry, the blocks are easier, but on the run, um, I was doing gels and then half tailwind in the bottles, right? Sort of mixing and matching. Um, uh, same, um, as long as you can get, you know, this was your thing, Scott, as long as you can get enough of the liquid in to make sure you're actually getting those calories. So, you know, on a race like Ultraman, you're sort of adjusting on the fly anyway. And, um, yeah. which is certainly a little different than like a 70.3, but. And I, I think to Brett's and, and e, I think it's great. Like, I think whilst we can give recommendations and everyone can read the research, everyone can like go through all this stuff. <clears throat> the point of practicing all this and logging it is to see what works for you. So that when you're logging all this stuff, like make notes in there and go, actually I did, I managed to do that with blocks and gels and I felt amazing or, shit, the blocks were impossible, but I managed to do it with just gels or actually I could do it for the first half of the buy. I, I like the idea of using a cut. If you're going really quick, and again, Brett, like there's going to be athletes within this program that maybe aren't as quick. And so they're just getting through it. And so it's like, there's a difference as well. Like the speed 
So like, you know, you have someone, again, like some of the pro athletes, they're like, I can't eat a picky bar like on there. I'm not going to do that. Um, for an Ironman, we say you have to do that because we're just talking total calories. For a 70.3, if you're moving really quick, I'm going to say to you, probably drop the bar. And Elliot, like, you know, wholeheartedly, like he was like, I can't eat a bar if I'm going quick. Fine. But we also know for a 70.3, you're getting it done in, you know, if you're talking quick, you're getting through it in four, less than five hours. I think we can manage that from a caloric standpoint, being in a fairly significant deficit for a 70.3. I think for an Ironman, that's where the bar on an hour actually becomes quite important just to get an extra 200 calories in because it's a calorie game in an Ironman. It's not, it's not even all about, you know, after three hours, you're using carbs and fat at a very similar rate. So it's just about getting calories in. So I think that individual and to Jason's point, like he's seeing some of the recommendations and going, you know what, I don't need this today. I can just do it because his focus is I can do this in a, you know, a fed state, but I don't need to practice in session fueling for this. Go for it. Oh, actually, I want to do a pre-session feed and I want to practice my in-session fueling for this session. Great. The recommendation is there. What you guys do with it is up to you. But if you do do the in-session fueling, then record it for your own sake so that you've got the data. And then if you want to do a call with one of us, you know, we'll go through it. Like there's heaps of data points that we can talk through and we can look at your averages and go, okay, what are you trying to achieve here? Um, so I think, I think there's lots of, lots of lessons from all of us. Hey, Scott, I want to make sure we... Yeah, I know. We're not, we're not going to get through all this, and that's all right. I, I was saying, let's, let's get through at least this third one real quick, and then let's get through Scott, Scott's question, Scott McIntyre. Yeah, yeah. About cool. So one of the questions we had in there, and you will have seen that the subjective questioning, we've changed it a little bit, and it's like, how hungry were you yesterday? And I guess, look... <laughs> There is a difference. I, I guess, again, think of what you're trying to achieve. If you guys are trying to drop a heap of weight, I think the hunger is going to be acceptable. You probably, uh, you probably are going to be a little bit hungry if you're trying to lose weight and we've got you in a calorie deficit. So I think it's more like if that hunger is disrupting your ability to function and that's happening on multiple days, then certainly let us know. Um, and it's not like, I don't, I don't mind if, if we are monitoring it and when athletes are ticking that they're hungry, um, it's good. Like, and if we see it, if it gets, if it happens, I think two or three days in a row, we generally reach out. Um, but think about what you're trying to achieve. If you're in full performance mode and you're starving, definitely let us know because that's really important because we're not, maybe, maybe we're not meeting your nutritional needs at that point. But if you, again, if you're in that context of, Hey, I'm trying to drop some weight hunger i'm a bit hungry ask yourself three questions are you hungry are you hungry or are you bored because you're sitting on your ass all day if you're bored get up go for a walk do some push-ups something like that are you hungry or are you thirsty drink some water drink a liter of water like cold water and then see are you still hungry and the third one um are you are you hungry or are you tired again get up do do 15 20 push-ups do some squats go for a bit of a walk around, see how you feel. Because the distinction between hunger and actually just your brain telling you you're a little bit like, you know, you're bored of sitting down all day and you're in the house because you're in lockdown and you just want to eat everything in the, in the pantry. I mean, I do it all the time. I'm terrible. So sort of think about that when you're thinking about your hunger. And, um, you know, we certainly don't want anyone starving, but we also want to understand what you're actually feeling. Uh, is, that, is that cool on that? I think uh, I think we all understand hunger and it, it sort of sucks, but you know, think of that. Um, I'm not. I'm actually not going to go into this. I think we'll go over this in another bit. Um, things to consider. I think Scotty, you were asking about bicarbonate. Is that right? Uh, yes. Yeah. There okay. was a. I threw an article in there. Yeah. That just talked about it and it had some research that supported it, and I was just curious your thoughts on it. I know you touched on it earlier briefly and yep. I'm not sure it's a great idea. Or if it's so sodium bicarbonate is, as you know, uh, is baking soda. Don't get it mixed up with baking powder. If you consume baking powder, you will explode um, literally from both ends. Uh, so don't do that. It's extremely cheap. It works. Um, 
its function though is probably more related to short intermittent bursts because what it's trying to do is change the acidity um, or the, the pH of your blood. So whilst you will hear stories about like diets, like the alkaline diet and that, they don't do anything to your blood pH, like 100%, they don't do anything. Um, when you look at what bicarbonate does, it can actually increase your pH. So it can make it more basic, which can offset um, acidosis or uh, like what you can would think of as lactate buildup. So it can offset that. Most of the research is done over short intermittent bursts. So we're talking somewhere between four and 10 minutes. Is that advantageous to you guys? I think there is merit in it. And if you actually talk to the guys, like I know the, the, um, the dietitian who works with, or the, the guy who works with team Ineos and on the tour, they use bicarbonate a lot and they're doing long duration stuff. So, but they use it to improve sprint performance. I mean, they have the advantage also that they're giving, getting given bottles um, on the course. So before they're hitting hills and things, they're actually consuming bicarbonate as they go. Um, I, I think it is worth playing around with. I think if you're doing, certainly if you're doing Olympic try, I would certainly be using bicarbonate and experimenting with it. I think for 70.3, I think it could be really useful supplement for training purposes um, and improving your, if you've got repeated sprint performance in training, I think either in running or on the bike, I think it could be a supplement to help with adaptation to training. Um, will it have any negative downsides on training and racing potentially? The downside is you will literally shit yourself or vomit um, if you take in too much. So that is the consideration. When you're taking this, you're taking in 0.3 grams per kilo of body weight. And that's probably the upper limit of what you're thinking initially. Um, so if you're thinking an 80 kilo athlete, that's uh, 20, what's that? 24 grams, 24 grams of a bicarbonate. Now you would split that as well across the day. Don't try and consume 24 grams of uh, bicarbonate soda in one go because again you'll have I mean go for it do it and you'll it's a good learning experience you won't feel very good um, but I would just split it up over the course of the day so you might take in like you know five five or what's that five five gram doses across the day in say 100 to 200 mils and you could just build that into your hydration for the day the other thing to consider is there seems to be some growing evidence that you can do chronic loading for bicarbonate so taking it for say five to seven days and it could have an, a lead on effect into race. So a bit like um, anyone who's done beta alanine, um, even carbohydrates, increasing your carbohydrates gradually, it could have a positive impact on it. So again, I would look at if you've got a really, you know, if you've got some repeated sprints on a, on a weekend, you could look at taking it the day before, just doing it once and seeing how that has an impact. You could look at doing it in the morning of that day and doing it. You could look at taking it for five days leading into that heavy day um, and see how you go. I would, I would do it repeatedly as well. I think doing it one off is not gonna provide you with any advantage. All right, very good, thanks, appreciate it. Cool. Um, look, it, it's one of those ones, I think it's uh, sprinkles on top, honestly. I think I, if I was going to get you to focus on one thing over the other, I'd say, look, work on your carbohydrate consumption um, and get that really good. And then work on things like, uh, you know, your beta alanine and your bicarb, um, cherry juice, things like that. Like Elliot used, you know, tart cherry juice to try and reduce DOMS because he had extended, like, you know, an Ultraman, we're trying to reduce inflammatory response in that. Um, I think for everyday supplements, you're talking your whey protein, your creatine, your carbohydrates, your electrolytes, your race day supplements is more the sprinkles on top. And that's probably only going to come after three or four races as well, where you've sort of, you've nailed down your hydration strategy, your carb strategy, and now you're getting into some of the like really cool things. So even race day supplements would come under caffeine as well and utilizing like a bolus of caffeine. And again, I wouldn't say let's go, everything all at once maybe throw in your caffeine and you know we do recommend it when you've got a race you will see that you know the, the red the recommendation is 90 minutes into a bike ride for a 70.3 is drop 200 milligrams of caffeine again please practice that 
before you go and do it in a race. Like if you're a small individual, start with 100 milligrams of caffeine and see how you respond. If you're really concerned, um, there is some evidence that not everyone responds to caffeine in the same way based on your genetic makeup. Um, you can get tested for that and see which, I think it's a CYP or a CYE gene um, SNP that determines, you know, how you respond to caffeine. Okay, um, I know we didn't get through everything, but that's all right. I think uh, end of the day, as Celie said, it's a long, it's a long game. I think everyone's in in it for the long game. You got a long season, and I think it's just it's all about layering and building in small habits as you go. And I know we we talk about health a lot. I think you know you build in these small habits around what you're eating on a daily basis for health. Then you're building in the habits around how those race meals look and then the habits within the sessions you know you're building in those hydration and carbohydrate type session uh type habits and getting better and better at those as you go yeah and just a quick reminder that we have a lot of these videos in the app where scott walks through a lot of these topics and so definitely go in there and check them out give us your feedback let us know what else you would like to learn about so we can continue to create this education for the crew yeah, so just tap the learn button at the bottom and, uh, you know, and again, like set topics. I think, I think today was really good and, you know, I think doing more of these and the goal is we're going to do these um, literally, I think every week, isn't it, Jay? We're going to just start opening them up every week and where you can jump on, jump off, ask questions, things like that. So, um, you know, there's only so much you can get through videos um, and through in-app notifications and stuff. So, I think hopefully, uh, hopefully you got a lot out of today and we can just uh, keep, keep the ball rolling.